Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Got the new Google Nexus 7 tablet in all its black glory. What's inside this thing? I'm glad you asked. You know what we say here on the EEV blog, don't turn it on, take it apart. And well, I don't think we're gonna get too many Phillips head screws on this sucker, so out it goes. We need our spudger. I think that's probably all we're gonna need. A couple of clips on the outside should just pop off. Fingers crossed. And yes, I'm using a metal spudger, not a plastic one. Sue me. I'll just get my spudger in this top side here and you can see there's just a couple of plastic clips there, plastic retaining clips, and it looks like it's gonna pop off a treat. Hopefully, that's the plan. We're almost in, almost in. I think it just needs a little bit more percussive maintenance, ta-da! I think I heard it. Yeah, looks good. That's it, oh, that was supremely easy. Thumbs up to Google, and no surprises really. The battery takes up a good lot of the room. What is that, you know, that's a good you know, two thirds of the area or something like that. We've got some beefy copper shielding up here to meet uh, EMI compliance and that sort of stuff. We've got another metal can chipset down here. A small board, you know, a relatively small board which just uh, L-shaped uh, wraps around there like that. And I suspect um, that might be it because based on the thinness of the uh, tablet, which really, you know, isn't uh, much at all, I think all we've got is the battery. The display is going to be directly under that, probably attached to the front panel, and just this one L-shaped board. They're going to have all the circuitry mounted on that. Of course, there'll be a lot of systems, um, system on chip integration in this thing. So I'd expect, you know, not much in the chipset department at all. There'll be a couple of, you know, uh, wireless uh, chipsets, external and stuff like that, but there'll be one main application processor and external memory and, you know, not a huge amount more. And on the side of the unit here, you can see tactile dome switches, four of them mounted directly on a flat flex uh, cable on an angle like, like that, which match up. We've got our uh, power button here. We've got our volume up and down, and that one's actually labeled reset. But it looks like there's a hole there on the case for it, but uh, it hasn't been drilled out. And on the other side here, where it does have a small hole, that goes through into there, and I'm not sure what's going on there, whether or not there's another uh, tack switch on the bottom side of that PCB down in there, that's another reset button perhaps. And on the same side of the case, just below that button, you can see the four external gold contacts there, clearly for either an external um, accessory device and or a remote serial interface for remote programming, monitoring, debugging, factory programming, the firmware, whatever it is, um, that is uh, a hacker's delight. And you can see how they've got the main PCB here and they're just using those little uh, leaf contacts to go down to a, what looks like a separate physical mounted thing, uh, you know, uh, module for those four gold contacts. If you take a look around the board here, you can see these little spring contacts directly on the PCB. These are for the three antennas they've got on the back of the case. You can see the three pairs of mating contacts here. And if we take a look at them, here's the near field antenna, uh, NFC antenna version 2.0. You can see the contacts, you can see the traces down in there. And there's your GPS antenna version 2.0 as well. And if we come over to here, what do we get? We get our Wi-Fi antenna version 3.0. So there you go, they're integrated into the back of the case. And you can see we've got some uh, more copper. And you see we've got more copper shielding on the back of the uh, case over here. So they've really gone to town there in terms of uh, shielding. And if we try and pry our battery out here, it should, in theory, be just held down with a bit of double-sided tape, and that does look to be the case. Well, I had to use a bit of uh, force down around here. They used a, quite a uh, very aggressive uh, double-sided tape there, but it uh, came off, really essentially no problems at all, and that's a huge thumbs up, no planned obsolescence 
in this thing, you can easily replace that battery. And just, you know, it's even got a connector. You can just pull the thing out, and I'm sure you'll be able to buy third-party batteries for this before you know it. Beautiful. And if we have a look at the battery pack here, it is an Zeus lithium polymer battery pack, C11ME370T. Uh, rated for, it's a single cell, of course, rated for uh, 3.7 volts at uh, 43, 25 milliamp hours or 16 watt hours. Beautiful. And clearly down in here on the side there, I can feel it and I can kind of see it down through there. They've got a battery protection PCB, which is absolutely essential for uh, lithium polymer uh, batteries. So you don't uh, abuse them, don't overcharge them, don't uh, over discharge them and uh, so they don't explode basically and that will be good quality um, you know uh, professional uh, protection circuitry in this device not just some uh, slap together one hung load cheapy and the EU obviously rate things differently because in the EU it's 4170 milliamp hours go figure and down here you'll notice that the micro USB and the 3.5 millimeter uh, phone jack they're actually mounted on separate boards. So uh, in theory, if they uh, wear out, I know the micro USB is rated to, you know, many thousands of uh, cycles, but still, if these wear out, um, in theory, you could probably replace them. And in the speaker department here, they do actually have whoop, dual speakers. There we go, boing. And it looks like to get at these devices under these metal shielding cans here, we're gonna have to take off the stickers and then pry the cans off. Get the trusty Swiss Army knife under there and we should be able to lift off that can. No problems at all. Ta-da! And this is going to be our GPS chipset. Dead giveaway it goes to the GPS antenna terminals here. And there it is. It's a Broadcom BCM 47511. And if we jump on over here to the Broadcom website, BCM 47511, here it is. It's an integrated monolithic uh, GNSS receiver. So it supports both uh, GPS and GLOSNAS as well, which is the uh, Russian counterpart to the GPS. So obviously they're uh, maybe targeting the Russian market here. And up here it says accurate real-time navigation and improved sensitivity in urban canyon environments. Ah, love the term urban canyon, but give me real canyons any day of the week. Anyway, it, um, it claims that, you know, low power consumption, uh, ultra low power tracking modes. And it's got a built-in LDO as well, which, of course, reduces your bomb cost. And they make a uh, point of um, doing that, of course, because, you know, systems integration stuff, you're looking to lower your bill of materials cost in these sort of things. If you're trying to eke out every cent, having an LDO, you know, a voltage regulator in there means you don't have to provide a local one. And... Uh, you know, uh, you still uh, probably need the uh, bypass uh, cap there, of course, for the LDO, but still, you know, you're saving a few cents there. Try and get under the other shielded can here. They're uh, really gone to town to ensure that these things pass. Here, mate, ta-da! Oh, there we go. It's uh, just a shielded top, and it contains a cage soldered directly soldered onto the pcb and what we've got here is our wi-fi antenna here so that looks like it's going to this chipset and this chipset here is for the uh, near field communications antenna and for the wi-fi we've got an azu wave awnh 665 and i've had to use my mantis microscope to get a look at this one it's very hard to read the brand on there but i can uh, definitely if i get it at the right angle it's an uh, invensense um, MPU 6050. And here we go. Let's check it out. It's a six axis uh, gyro accelerometer men's motion tracking chip. Beautiful. And if you go through the marketing spiel, uh, the world's first and only six axis motion tracking device designed for low power, low cost, high performance smartphones, tablets, and wearable sensors. It contains Inven sensors, motion fusion, and runtime calibration firmware. Beautiful. That eliminates cost, uh, costly and complex selection, qualification, and system level integration of discrete devices. Beautiful. Once again, more system on chip stuff. They're really integrating all this stuff 
together. And uh, it combines a three-axis gyroscope and three-axis accelerometer on the same die uh, together with a uh, digital motion processor as well. So it's not just your usual, you know, uh, serial um, output uh, accelerometer or analog output a MEMS accelerometer, what you might be used to, um, you know, cheap as chips. This one's got a uh, built-in processor as well, uh, and capable of processing complex nine-axis motion fusion algorithms. Mmm, sounds complex. And it has an external I2C bus as well for an external magnetometer. So this thing claims to have a magnetometer in it, so that must be an external I2C device on the board somewhere. Um, it's a QFN footprint, as we saw, and... Uh, it looks uh, quite nice for precision tracking to both fast and slow algorithms. Part feature user programmable gyro, full range, plus minus 250 up to plus minus uh, 2000 degrees per second. Um, and a user programmable acceleration range from 2G to plus minus 16G. Beautiful. And it uh, works at 3.8 milliamps presumably uh, down at 3.3 uh, volts if you have a look over here it's got uh, uh, low power operating modes 10 microamps at 1 hertz um, up to 140 microamps at 40 hertz and uh, it contains a 5 microamp idle mode as well and it's uh, the i squared uh, c interface um, up to 400k or a 20 megahertz spi as well Excellent, and it's tolerant up to 10,000 Gs of shock, which sounds like a lot, but when you, you know, if you drop this thing onto, you know, a hard concrete or steel surface on its edge and the plastic is coupled directly through to the printed circuit board, which is connected, soldered directly onto the chip, you can, um, in theory, uh, easily exceed that uh, 10,000 G uh, shock uh, rating and damage the device. And it also contains a built-in uh, digital out temperature sensor as well and a uh, sync capability supports electronic um, image stabilization and GPS so it can you know sync and track together with your GPS. Brilliant. And it's smart enough to generate an interrupt as well for gesture type, type stuff when you pan in, zoom in, um, you know, a free fall interrupt. Oh no, it's falling, you know, the device is falling quick. Do something like, I don't know, what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually uh, play a, a wave file that says, catch me, catch me. I don't know. There you go. Um, and it's got zero motion detection as well, touch de uh, tap detection, shake detection. So um, all these things um, can interrupt the CPU and then, you know, so the CPU doesn't have to be continually processing this sort of stuff. It's all done on the processor on this chip, freeing up the resources from the main processor, uh, which allows it to detect all these, uh, you know, user interactions with the device. Excellent. Well worth having. Well worth paying, you know, um, you know, 50 cents or a dollar more for compared to, you know, discrete um, accelerometers and stuff like that. And for our near field communications, we've got an NXP PN65. And NXP seem to be getting a few design wins for this uh, chipset. It's also used in the Samsung Galaxy uh, S3 and uh, others. So it's uh, almost becoming a bit of a uh, little uh, de facto standard for uh, near field communications there. I suspect when we lift up all this stuff, and even if I did unscrew this board, I'm not sure if I'm gonna do it, but uh, I wouldn't expect there to be anything on the bottom side of the board. Why? Because you've got a fair bit of you know area on top of here. This is more than enough uh, square surface area for all of the processing and all the sensing required for one of these tablets. So no reason to go double-sided load. And it's got a Hydus brand uh, 072WX2 display. That's the uh, IPS display 1280 by 800. And if we peel off some of this black tape holding down this flat flex cable here going to the display then we get another metal can there which we can lift the skirt on that and have a look looks like we've got power supply circuitry so nothing terribly uh, surprising or interesting in there for the uh, switch mode power supply apart from the shielding of course uh, you know full metal can shielding you don't want your DC to DC converter to be uh, spewing out any garbage. It'd be, you know, high frequency one, a megahertz or more. It'd be, you know, quite efficient, optimized for the power consumption of this uh, device. So, you know, I'd expect, you know, upwards of like 90% efficiency, 
something like that. And inside there I spied a Texas Instruments TPS 63020 and yeah there you go up to 90% uh, efficiency maximum 3 amp out output current at 3.3 volts um, you know and uh, 2 point out uh, amps output at uh, VIN is 2.5 so that'll be like the uh, lowest point of the lithium ion uh, rechargeable or uh, lithium polymer batteries sorry so that'll be the sort of you know the top end to the low end of the battery voltage so it's anywhere from uh, 3 amps at the maximum battery voltage as you know VN 3.6 and as the battery uh, drops the maximum uh, output current available is only 2 amps and of course that's a buck boost uh, topology as well because the battery voltage uh, as it drops from say 3.6 volts to 2.5 volts input you've got to maintain that 3.3 volts uh, output so the input voltage can be above or below the regulated output voltage so you even need a uh, sepic uh, converter or you know a buck boost topology and here's an efficiency versus output uh, current graph here and you can see the uh, efficiency from 0 to 100 percent on the y-axis in the output current uh, from basically uh, nothing up to 4 amps and they would have chosen this device extremely carefully um, not only based on cost that may not have even been a major factor they probably would have wanted maximum efficiency because battery life in a product like this is you know can uh, can kill you it can kill your market if you're you know got an hour less battery life than the new ipad or the new other you know x brand uh, tablet then you're going to get killed so it's worth spending you know as <laughs> whatever you need to to get a dc to dc converter to match your requirements and you want the utmost in efficiency so they would have chosen this device based on uh, mostly you know most of the decision would have been based on the operating point the operating current you know would have been around the peak of this curve here the efficiency curve so they'd be getting you know uh, 85 to over 90 percent efficiency with this thing um, and that's how you design these sort of products to meet your target market and the one on the right here of course is the one for the just the main operation power save mode is disabled but this one on the left power save mode enabled also when the things powered down um, it's also got various efficiencies that's actually uh, pretty darn good over a quite a uh, range of low output currents there I really like it so you can bet your bottom dollar that the uh, design engineers would have just poured over these data sheets and they would have you know dozens and dozens of different DC to DC converters to choose just the right perfect one you know they're up to midnight reading these graphs and the efficiency curves and you know trying to pick the best bang for buck chip they can get trade off between cost and efficiency over your various operating modes which they would have known you know they would have uh, done uh, tests on this system they would have known and when they're uh, trying to design the final board for production they would have had um, uh, current uh, targets and they would have you know uh, all these things matter in terms of uh, when the battery voltage drops you know when it's above when the battery voltage is above the uh, output uh, voltage what's the efficiency when it's below when the input voltage is below the output voltage what's the efficiency and power down oh and you know as a, some poor design engineer um, power design engineer at uh, Zeus probably you know spent a month pouring over these bloody data sheets and if we peel back our main foil here um, which was a bit of a pain but I managed to get it out we've got our main Nvidia processor and the memory and some more power supply stuff and down in the power supply section here Maxim have a design win it's the Max 77612A but somewhat curiously I couldn't find any info on that one on the Maxim website but clearly it's some sort of power management controller and we have a date code on the silk screen here 20th week 2012 and the process is a bit of a beast it's an Nvidia who you usually associate with uh, just uh, graphics cards and graphics uh, processors it's a uh, T30L Tegra and if you have a look here at the corners they've actually gunked that down they've epoxied the corners of the chip down uh, to really keep this in place and they've done that on all four corners and that's a quad core ARM Cortex uh, processor working up to a maximum of 1.2 gigahertz 
And here we've got our uh, SD RAM split into two different devices here. They're an El Pider uh, brand, and that's a DDR3 memory. And it seems like I was a little bit uh, off on the single-sided load uh, comment here. Clearly, they've, uh, there's uh, extra circuitry on the bottom because we're missing the uh, flash memory as well. There's got to be a couple of flash devices in there, the 8 and the 16 gig. And I think if I look under the board here I can uh, see extra circuitry on the bottom and we're missing um, other stuff like the uh, touchscreen uh, controllers as well. Really um, I'm running out of time and uh, really I don't want to uh, tear down this any further. I want to put it back together, rush home, let the wife play with it, um, hopefully if I haven't killed it and uh, so I won't take the board off. As you can see it's a rather interesting uh, construction. They've got you know a um, uh, chassis in there to keep the uh, battery in place. They've got the L-shaped board. They haven't really wasted a lot of space in this thing. Uh, they've tried to keep it as uh, thin as possible. I'm not sure uh, what's going on with this over here, but yeah, it's um quite. It's very well built. They they certainly haven't uh, cut uh, any costs at all, and they've really knocked uh, the EMC on the head. They've done a really good job there, and the all the uh, antennas integrated in the top of the case. I didn't find an RFID chip in there, by the way. Uh, haven't, uh, maybe, you know, I don't think there is one. Anyway, it's all been a rather interesting teardown, and I hope you liked it. And if you want to discuss it, uh, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. The link's right there. And remember, if you like Teardown Tuesday, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time. You little ripper, not a problem.